Yeah, my introduction is going to be a little similar to the ones we've heard uh, already because I also f was really delighted but surprised <laughs> <laughs> to be invited. <laughs> um, so I'm an early modernist. I work on, on um, initially mostly on Europe, uh, but I've been working on Asia since uh, I started the project that I'll talk, talk about. Um, I do have a firm interest in women's work and I've I have a PhD in the history of women's work and especially women's role in trade um, in the Dutch Republic, so 17th century, 18th century Netherlands. Um, and in my time as a graduate student, I read a lot of uh, studies on African women's work. So uh, that was another sort of thing that got me really excited to be here. Um, and for the talk today, what I wanted... Oh, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to talk about the, the project that I've recently completed. So, um, um, uh, a project that we did with, um, in total, six other research and a lot of student uh, collaboration in Amsterdam. And um, in that project, we also, because we were struggling with the same problems that... Um, the project here is is dealing with we were also trying to find new ways and using all methodologies and changing them tweaking them a little bit to find out more about ephemeral everyday activities in the city um, so the method we developed is called the snapshot method so and that's that's what i want to um, sort of um, lay out for you today but also some of our results um, let me start by introducing the, the project. The project is called The Freedom of the Streets, Gender and Urban Space in um, Eurasia between 1600 and 1850. And uh, when I designed the project, I also stemming from my earlier work on, um, on women and economic development, and I worked on the informal sector as well in the, in the pre-modern city, um, I was really interested in this, this sort of um, a long standing narrative about the relationship between urban modernity and the withdrawal of women from the street into the home. And especially this contrast, and it's been really nice actually to prepare this for a talk in Paris because I've been showing this slide for years and years, but never in Paris, <laughs> where you see early modern Amsterdam, 17th century Amsterdam, contrasted with a street scene of 19th century Paris. And in my mind, this sort of reflects very well what was the standard narrative. So an early modern city was chaotic, um, uh, disorderly, um, street patterns were very sort of organic, um, uh, people would mingle, both social classes as well as gender. Uh, and then in, when modernity arrives, you see the cleaning of the streets, the, um, withdrawal of women if women are out and about and I deliberately obviously cut the woman off here but there are f a few in the background they always are chaperoned and we all know I think that this is um, uh, a, a rather false representation I think of street life also in both periods I would say but um, uh, it, it, it keeps being repeated in the literature really and one of the issues that I found was when I looked look closer into it was that people tended to sort of state yeah we know it's different it's it's maybe not as rigid this this uh, this change but uh, so so the, the the goal I set for the project was to investigate bottom-up what street life and gender dynamics in the street were actually uh, over time and also in different uh, contexts and I think I've I've sort of um, juggled my s slides a little I realize now but what we um, um, so I'll go to the next one what we also wanted to do was to write a history that is not so Eurocentric or not so Western because if you look at the literature most of the literature about gender and urban space was about England um, mostly 18th century, Renaissance Italy, or the United States. So we wanted to find out what, whether this, this change from a pre-modern to a modern city 
um, and a female or mixed city to a more male public space uh, happened and whether that happened in cities that didn't really um, uh, fall in the in the pattern of a, a traditional uh, American or, or European city like London or Paris for instance. So we looked at Amsterdam and Edo. Edo is Tokyo. Um, those were our core study uh, case studies. Um, I'm happy to elaborate for a long time about why we chose them, <laughs> uh, but I'll do that afterwards. Um, and then we added two more as the project developed. One was Batavia in um, uh, currently Jakarta as a colonial city, but we also added Berlin uh, as a special case study to compare Berlin and Amsterdam and the relationship between gender and urban green spaces, because cities are not just uh, made of bricks and, and mortar. Um, and we looked um, at four different elements in, in trying to understand the dynamics of, of uh, gendered urban spaces. So we looked at um, uh, materiality. So what is the quality of the street and the size and the width, uh, the type of buildings surrounding it, whether there was a relationship between houses and windows and the street and doors or verandas or not, or those kinds of features. We looked at governance, so laws, what kind of rules did there exist, normative frameworks, uh, gender norms, for instance, and we looked at movement. And I have to explain that a little because on the one hand, we were mapping movement and use, but we also hypothesized that the, the usage and movement of certain people at certain moments of the day might have excluded other people uh, from using that space. So I was always thinking about uh, the city centre of Amsterdam where we have a prostitution district whether and it makes a, m a massive difference where you whether you go there at night or in the daytime or even my son's nursery was in is was in the middle of the red light district in the morning when we when we when we went there it was full of parents with small children in the evening when we picked him up it was busy with tourists who would sort of <laughs> shout at us for, for, for actually thinking of bringing your kid to a nursery in the, in the red light district. So it was constantly a different dynamic. And in the evenings, very late, as a woman, you wouldn't feel that comfortable, depending on what kind of, um, yeah, for what reason you were there. So it's that kind of um, um, uh, relationship that we also wanted to uh, show. And this is just briefly to... to um, indicate what kind of methods and sources we started from. So this is really from how we set it up initially, a combination of, I have to look at my own slide now, of gender norms um, and governance that we got from these types of records. Oh, oh sorry. Don't worry. Uh, movement. So that's, that's the snapshot method that we use in combination with GIS map, uh, mapping. And materiality we looked at through um, uh, 3D reconstructions of streetscapes. So we were with a really amazing team. Um, actually, today is the very last day that Antonia was part of the project. Her contract <laughs> ended today, and now it's just me, basically, who's <laughs> who's left. Um, and we all had different expertises, so that was really wonderful. Art historians, visual historians, architects, and sort of regular historians. Um, and different also uh, 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 um, geographical knowledge. So the first thing and the major challenge throughout has been this issue of blind spots in history. And in our case, the blind spot was obviously everyday street use because people don't record that. So how do you find it? Now, um, Having been trained as a historian of women's work and having worked a lot with uh, groups, for instance, in Sweden, um, who, who have been working on how to tackle um, this problem of, of uh, well, we've already heard this, the issue of censuses that might not record women's work properly or um, tax registers in our case for the early <coughs> modern period, etc. Um, um, we, we um, embarked on thinking about how to improve or how to use those insights to to develop a methodology that we could use 
And um, Maria Ogman is one of the key scholars in this field, and she has written a wonderful book with her team, and the next one is actually coming up. Um, and one of the things that she also um, um, states is that we need yeah, better data and big data on everyday practices, and that's, that's really what we also try to find. Um, Maria Ogren and her team, in a, in a way, built on the work that is being done by uh, uh, um, Sheila Ogilvie. And Sheila Ogilvie has written uh, a paper with Andrew Karras. And I thought, because it's a methodological conference, it, it might be useful for you as well, um, on how to turn qualitative evidence into quantitative evidence. Um, and that's again about using the types of sources and the types of methods that we've been hearing about and how then to sort of scale up so that you can also make quantitative assessments. So um, in a way, maybe I go back to this one briefly. Um, what this uh, group in Sweden did and what Ogilvy has done in the past as well is using court records. Um, and extract information on people's activities from these records. And then, you know, if you read books and books and books and you just go through them and collect every observation on what people do when they uh, sort of c come before a court and they testify about an, a, a crime or an incident or, or whatever, you get a lot of really interesting data on all kinds of work activities that you otherwise wouldn't find. Uh, so lots of incidental uh, material that has proven to be very um, uh, relevant for, for better understanding what men and women actually do. And, and it's very often um, different from what they state as an occupational identity. And this is an example of the method that the Swedish team has developed and they call it the verb-oriented method. So they, they said we shouldn't look at nouns, we shouldn't look at people's um, occupation as I'm a spinner or I'm a weaver, but we need to look at what they describe themselves as doing. So this is um, sort of from a lit piece of literature actually, but, but it's a way for them to illustrate what they do. So um, far away in the field, Emil's father and Alfred were working away with their skies. Behind them came Lina and Kreuse Maya, gathering up the cut rye, tying it in, into sheaves. And, and that's that's what that kind of text they they take and they turn it into this data that has been depicted here. So you have activities and individuals, and then in their case they can also I can maybe make this smaller. Yeah, um, you can even go further, link it to a place description in this case in the field and to a work condition. So they also looked at labor relations in that sense. Um, so this is a bit of, of how this method um, that the Swedish team developed worked. Uh, okay, sorry, yes, yeah. So how to use this method to, to capture the everyday street use of women. Um, for us it, it was really important and even more so than for the Swedish team to capture all activities that we found, so in, in fact all verbs. So we needed events, and those events needed to be linked to people and to a location, because we also wanted to understand both the geography, uh, questions about how far do people move beyond their own neighborhood or uh, from their houses, etc. But also location for us was also a way to think about spatial structures, so think about uh, in the narratives and the, and the traditional story about the, the, the rise of the boulevard and the way that this space is then claimed by other groups of people than the street before, it really matters that it's a wide space and that you get surveillance, these kinds of issues. So for us, putting observations on a map, on an actual location, was really important because we could also then relate it to the urban built environment. Um, what we did, and I think I thought it was nice to mention it since you're now just starting, but what we did a lot was talk to the people in the Gender and Work Project. So we held yearly meetings uh, where we did very sort of stuff that probably no one else was interested in. 
<laughs> we put up our databases, our categories, all the all the nitty gritty of how do you, why do you t why do you label this that way? How do you how do you um, write queries and why do you combine certain aspects? Uh, is what we sort of continuously discuss with them, and that was really super uh, helpful and has really made a major difference to our project. And in fact, inspired them also to start thinking more about spaces and spatial relations um, in the context of work as well. And um, we also worked with labs. So um, in this photo, two of our lab technicians are there. Um, and we worked with um, a lab in Amsterdam, a digital humanities lab, as well as, uh, or two in fact, as well as a lab in Tokyo and then obviously we didn't travel to Tokyo as often but we also held regular uh, those regular meetings about just the nitty-gritty of the of the of, of of doing research and placing identifying spaces in Tokyo or or these kinds of things so that was that was one of the things that I've really learned from from this process um, and out of all that <laughs> came this uh, so um, what we did is uh, turn this or further develop, I think, this, this verb oriented method into the snapshot method where we um, extract data from a range of sources and place them first on a historical map that is then also lay tied to an, an, an actual uh, current map of the city and adding layers of information. So. Um, all kinds of patterns of urban life, uh, spatial features, and, and both the material and the immaterial city. And this picture already illustrates that we did, uh, we, we also changed uh, the method that the, the Swedish team used in another way. We used court records or court-like records, uh, witness depositions from Amsterdam. They were brilliant. They were, uh, um, the, yeah, I think, uh, the most detailed that I've ever seen. But for Tokyo, those weren't that good. And so for Tokyo, we had to search for other materials and um, we started to use visual uh, materials that we also knew had some sort of grounding in reality. Uh, so that was important. And at the same time, it was also an experiment. Let's see what happens if we use visual materials and start plotting it and to what extent do you get a sort of artistic representation on the map of, of what a street might have looked like and where might it actually overlap with reality. I'll, I'll say more about that in, the, uh, in a minute. Um, so these are the depositions we use for Amsterdam and we could, they are, as I said, really very rich. Um, they were just really accessible when we started this project so that was, was really very nice. Um, and we could get names, so we could get gender, marital status, which uh, sometimes also occupation for men generally. We could get locations, uh, and that was really instrumental. So both the location of the incident, which is fairly normal for, for say, court record where you find fights or other kinds of stuff. Uh, but here we also found, uh, we also got residency uh, locations. So that was uh, crucial, and I'll show you why. And we got uh, events and activities, obviously. For uh, the visual materials for Japan, we, we developed um, a system where, as you can see in this screen, we could isolate every figure using a technique called triple IF. And, and I can really recommend that. That um, allows you to um, annotate visual sources uh, whilst they are being kept, you don't have to import them into your own system. So they're kept in the, in the library system or archival collection and you annotate them um, through this system uh, and the annotations are, are sort of kept. So that's really wonderful. Um, and we could sort of, yeah, um, in a way uh, deconstruct these whole images and take all the figures separately or take figures together. This is an example of how we did it. So uh, combining this material, this is a, uh, uh, the visual materials, a city guide of Edo, um, combining that with um, a sort of shopping guide of the same period, we could first uh, identify the, the block or the street and then later on even a smaller 
block and we could really fairly closely pinpoint uh, the activities to the uh, to the, to a map of the same uh, period. Um, yeah, I already said a little bit about this issue of using visual materials. So uh, people uh, were quite used to using this method for, for court records, maybe also for diaries, which we also did, and maybe for letters. There was some experimentation with literary material, but visual material people hadn't really tried. And um, both for Amsterdam and for Edo, we knew the resources that, that, that scholars who were experts deemed um, relatively accurate, as in quite true representations. And when we started, we thought that was enough for us to start experimenting with it. Uh, and then we, uh, in a way, one of the postdocs hit the jackpot when she went to a museum and found the actual sketches in their collections that nobody had ever looked at. And she found really close, um, yeah, uh, as you can see here, this is the sketch for the for the final image, and there are some alterations, but they're fairly minimal. And she also found that people in their writings said um, uh, contemporaries at the time, uh, who, one was recommending the guidebook to another, and that person said it's actually not so interesting because it's just what it what the city looks like. So I'm not so excited about this book. So we were really sort of. Um, yeah, it really confirmed our, our um, uh, idea that we were quite close to what the city of Tokyo would have looked like at that time. Um, now, we, as I said, we worked with a, 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 a one lab that, that created our database. So they built for us a very flexible system that first was designed for Amsterdam, where we could change as we went along. That's also one of the things that we learned from the Swedish group. Don't <laughs> just just uh, uh, don't try to come up with a system at first that you can't change anymore and try not to label. So they also didn't categorize their, their for instance, their activities for a very long time because you have to be able to, otherwise you have to constantly redo it. And so we also started with a very flexible system where we could constantly change both the labeling or the categories that we felt were important or the fields that we wanted to enter. And that was really interesting because first we entered a lot of data on Amsterdam, then, then Edo came along and first we used diaries and later visual materials. And we constantly needed to re, re um, do the database design and the ontology. Um, well, the ontology, the basic ontology was the same, but the, the changes uh, sort of in the uh, more finely grained um, aspects were, were, were constantly shifting. Um, so that's one of the things I also learned from doing this international comparison with different, uh, with different languages and different um, uh, structures and different types of sources that you have to constantly uh, change that. Um, and this is an example, but it's probably, n no, you can't read it. So we, we had a system where we could fill in person data, event data, and location data. And the location data was always instantly plotted on a map. So because it was so important, we, we instantly plotted that on a, on a contemporary uh, georeference map of, of the city. Uh, and yeah, I can read here, for instance, we had um, things like animals in there. So if we wanted, we could indicate animals. In the end, we, we hardly had animals there. We um, also had weather there because I was really interested in seasonality. And um, I also, in the beginning of the project, got, got a lot of comments about people or from people who said, uh, street life in the Netherlands, really, it rains. Do people go out? So I, I just wanted to sort of have it in also for that reason and thinking about how certain patterns of mobility might change. Um, and another thing was really, really relevant and it, it was relevant for court records, but turned out to be also super relevant for uh, visual materials. And that is background and foreground. So we use that as a way to distinguish um, for instance, with court records, you have the crime or the, f or the fight or the incident, and you have all the stuff that's happening 
around it and we were obviously not interested in a crime database so we always use that um, category to indicate do the activities that we now label are they directly um, related to the crime or is it the part where people say oh I was doing this and this and then that happened and for uh, visual sources you have the same sort of issue where you in a street scene might have this sort of central scene where we, where that is really where the art is focused on and the stuff in the background and the question always is what is more reliable but being able to to um, distinguish between the two was was really very helpful um, I also wanted to show this although it's not quite part of the snapshot method but the data that we collected on mobility and street use we also connected to this materiality so we had one postdoc and a, a, and a 4D research lab who helped us create um, these 3D reconstructions um, and obviously it's very time consuming <laughs> so we could only select uh, two uh, uh, places in, in, in one in each city of the main case studies and stuff that we did with this was was uh, like in the in the in the Edo the top one uh, that we looked at the difference between night and day and visibility so could you see people in the building could they see you when you're in the street uh, questions about sound and surveillance and also about whether for instance in this case with the figures if you go around the corner, can you see people, or how do, how do these things interact? And in the Bloemstraat case, we looked, for instance, at who was living there also, uh, how densely populated were these houses, what does that mean for people being out on the street, because our court records show that a lot of people there um, were actually outside quite a lot on their, on their stairs and the stoops in front. So how, how is that related to density and urban density in general? And we also managed to in the find for this area uh, walking routes between home and work and, and, and these kinds of questions. So, um, um, uh, but this is still very much, I mean, we've managed to build these uh, reconstructions, but, but continuing to ask the questions that we really wanted to ask and that's partly due to COVID um, we we still have st uh, stuff to explore now um, I wanted to show you what I think is the power of the anecdotal or, or the incidental so the stuff that we get from from the uh, sources by applying this method and the stuff that a lot of people take for granted or just simply ignore the first example comes from the PhD thesis from, from one of the graduate students who focused on Amsterdam and those court records. Um, and he was able to, by using this residence location and also the location of the incident, was able to reconstruct uh, walking routes through the city. So we knew where someone lived and we knew where someone was found at the moment of, an, of a particular incident. And then we use the computer to infer what the most, uh, the quickest or the logical walking route was. And uh, this is an early example of plotting those kinds of lines for, uh, for 1750. But you get a bit of a sense of where people go in the city, how far their ranges were, um, and how. Um, yeah, we already knew a little bit based on the m morphology of the city, you can calculate how, how accessible certain parts are, but we, that was not never really um, contrasted and compared with, with actual movement. Um, and what was really interesting is, uh, so this is a, a sort of a picture uh, um, that I used a lot when I did my PhD on women in trade. This was the picture that we sort of had in our head about Amsterdam in this period, uh, which was a very full of women, a lot of freedom for women also to go out both of both uh, the sort of wealthy and uh, more lower social classes. And then what he found, in fact, and, and this is sort of a graph of that earlier picture about how far do people go from their houses, but then with uh, one layer added, um, 
uh, where do they go, how far are they found from their homes at a particular time of day. So we also had the exact hour in those court records. So we were able to trace, um, I don't know how many observations, but a quite a lot, um, how far men and women were from their houses at a particular moment of the day. Um, and what was interesting about this picture was that it shows a pattern that is very similar. The top line is for men, the bottom line is for women. Uh, so they, they do for, uh, follow a, s a similar pattern throughout the day, but obviously men go out much further, that's one thing. Um, and women stay really close to their homes, uh, that's the other thing. Um, Meters away from home, exactly. And what is really interesting is the dotted line is what he calls the neighborhood line, because um, um, we were also thinking about when are you leaving your sort of home territory, right? And he found, <laughs> he found in one of his court documents a description where in an argument between who has the um, wife who works best in the neighborhood, uh, between two men, really uh, quite an amusing argument, but it provided us really interesting information because uh, one guy says, well, actually, my wife is much better than the others uh, in the neighborhood. In, in our neighborhood, uh, uh, I think he says about 20. Yeah, he has a number of houses and that, that corresponds with 200 meters. So we've basically set this neighborhood level at, at 200. And then you see that women go out in the afternoon, early evening, a bit further than that, but that's it, they stay there. And men um, um, go out much further. I mean, the top one are, are, are people who are night patrols. So their they're, they're, um, range is much further anyway. Uh, and the other thing that is really interesting that came out is the drop late evening and that is exactly when the um, city gates close. So everybody returns to their home or neighborhood then. Um, so this is an example of a graph that I would have never imagined we would be able to make before we started. So this is, is sort of sheer luck and it's been interesting because it actually countered my uh, own hypothesis that, that women are much more free. In yeah, and for me the surprise was also that women actually don't go that far out of, of, of the neighborhood and also stay very, very close to home or at home. Uh, again, there, there might be a sort of source element there. I can talk about that in the in the question uh, section, but it, it, it was a really striking result. Now, the second example comes from the work of the one of the postdocs who worked on Edo, and she looked at these visual materials, and, and one of the things that she found was, and I'll go back quickly, uh, is that uh, a, a type of work that was completely absent in, for instance, our uh, court records for Amsterdam also, uh, but is very obvious in the visual materials uh, and that was care work so I hope it will so when we started looking at these images and starting to identify the figures and especially the female figures there we found a lot of women holding children by the hand carrying children um, uh, and many many more than than in those written materials and so that really made us think about how care work is registered, obviously, and is even um, sort of not mentioned when women themselves recount what they were doing at the time. And when we were doing this in parallel, both text and image, we found a lot of things that were very visible in the, um, in the, in the visual materials that actually completely disappear in the textual and the other way around. So it, it also showed us how we really need both to understand what is going on um, at that moment. And um, another example, this was done with the, the postdoc in combination with the student, is laundry work. Again, we found very little in the, um, in the, in the court records for Amsterdam, and we found loads of laundry work, but also other kinds of housework that was taking place outside in the visual materials that we also, because these, these images were very clear both on location and on um, 
uh, and they're also fairly accurate as in we can assume this is um, uh, and maybe not a direct representation, but something that is likely to have happened at that time and, uh, and that place um, that we could plot on a map and became more visible. So stuff that I also didn't realize, we see a lot of laundry now being done in the city center. And we knew about laundry being done on the ramparts and linen laid out there to, to dry. But because of our work on the visual materials, we realized that a lot of people were actually hanging uh, linens on the bridges of the prestigious canals in Amsterdam or on uh, barges that were normally meant for straw or for other kinds of goods so um, and occasionally you find an incident in a court record about people fighting over the use of that kind of space but it became much more clear here and it made us also rethink the, the, the nature of the city and the nature of urban space and you think actually you have so little green space in Amsterdam at that time so it makes total sense uh, also with the reflection maybe of the sunlight and the water to put your laundry out there uh, but it's something that that only came to us when we started looking properly at these images and, and taking them seriously and this the third example is an example that I've been working on myself which is uh, Batavia and is um, instead of a sort of serial record uh, that gives you a snapshot of one person's activity at, at, uh, at a particular moment, but just in one spot, um, comes from a court record that I found, or rather a, a sort of a crime report of a really horrendous uh, murder case uh, in Batavia, which le uh, uh, let me reconstruct the way um, yeah, sort of an, an ordinary morning in Batavia and what it, what it looked like and what people were doing in the street. So this is a case where an enslaved man has escaped from his owner and he uh, one morning re-enters the city and uh, uh, you can, yeah, I could re reconstruct where he went and all the victims he made. So you tend to read these things as a crime report and, and it's a really awful crime report and uh, it's very detailed with all the injuries, etc. Um, yes, yeah, really horrendous. But then I try to also again step back and see what is happening just before. And if you do that, you get a really lovely <laughs> sight of what is what is street life and work in Batavia in the morning, on a Friday morning on uh, at nine o'clock. And we managed to uh, yeah, identify all these different people. So a ferry operator, a meat seller, another street, a street vendor, a bricklayer who is walking somewhere, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we also could link it to um, um, some people who are in that list, who were, are affected by this crime, are also registered in this part of town as landowners, so we could connect them. And um, we could even do a bit more because there's one woman and I'm still trying to figure it out, but she's a Malay woman and she's baking biscuits or koekjes, so maybe probably fried fritters or uh, some sort of snack for on the go to what it, it says, uh, the komende en gaande man, so it means the, the, the people who are coming and going. So. It, it gave me some insight in how these uh, flows of people, workers, are actually, this is already past the rush hour, it's nine o'clock, it's getting quite warm already, but still she's there m uh, baking this, um, uh, or, or frying these fritters. And this image, I, I need to talk to more experts, but I, I found this image from exactly the same time when there's a woman also using something that looks at a, as a sort of cooking device that is still used in uh, Jakarta at the moment by street vendors. So it might be that, although we were a bit worried about her hand <laughs> just above the uh, frying pan, that might be a bit tricky, but so we can't quite know. And another of these combinations of text and image again, which tells us more is, is that figure number B, who is a Chinese person. Um, who apparently was just walking uh, around the city with meat and um, had just sort of, um, he had been selling and he just 
uh, put down his basket and then he was robbed of his knife by the perpetrator. Uh, so that was all lovely. And then I thought, hey, um, the most famous picture of Batavia uh, that is that is still uh, um, there and was hung in the Dutch, Dutchies in their company headquarters also has a Chinese meat seller. At the exact same spot, this Chinese meat seller was robbed. And the painter of this painting was in the city at the exact same moment this crime took place. So the curators in the Rijksmuseum don't like the fact that I link the two because they say it's a composition of types. And I know that. Um, this is him. <laughs> Um, with a knife, in fact, and with meat, etc., and with the baskets beneath his table. Um, so th the painter used these kinds of ty um, um, types, but he sketched them on loca location. And he painted the painting in Amsterdam later on. Um, so even though I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to say at the moment, this is, this is my guy. But I'm going to say that the guy that I found in that crime report and the way he was working and the tools he was using is probably very similar to this person because he's on the same spot, et cetera, et cetera. So here again, for me, the, the combination of the image and the tax really uh, showed me much more than I knew also about this kind of informal vending practices in, in Batavia at this time that we actually, yeah, we have these lovely drawings, but people haven't really been thinking about it. So to round off, I wanted to say a few things that we learned and also realized while we were doing this. And that's the issue of, I think, the word versus the image or the Clark versus the artist. So whenever we present our work, people are always very critical of us using visual sources in the way that we do. And they always say you can't because it's a representation. But they tend to forget that the court records also are representations. And one of the things, again, also with lots of discussions with the people from Sweden, is what we've been thinking about is how, and it, it's not just us, there's also a really wonderful book by Francis Dolan about um, yeah, the problem of these kinds of records and using them as a sort of literary, uh, lit literal representation of, the, of reality, is that you never know who writes and who speaks and what is uh, sort of summarized and what is forgotten about and that became very clear when we put yeah uh, certain scenes in the visual next to scenes in the in the in the in the textual together where you saw certain elements missing so i think one of the challenges for the future at least for my, myself is to think more about what what the clerk does and what the artist does and to what extent these are different and how best um, to get a better sense of what we do with texts like these where lots of it is crossed through or even with very neat texts where we don't know what is left out or and one of the things i i would be interested in in exploring in the future is trying to see if with ai and and text recognitions and patterns language patterns we can sort of maybe get a better sense of where we're closer to the to the truth and where we might be reading something that is a very sort of standard phrase or formula. Um, I think for all of you, maybe the thing I read is the most interesting uh, paper. These, these are some of the stuff that we've produced and the red one is the one about the, the method. Um, yeah, and, and I think this is, uh, this is it. Thank you very much.